be better stewards over our mental health? How can we be better stewards over our mental well-being? Because that's not talked about a lot. So we're having that conversation on tonight, and we're going to have that conversation again on next week as well, uh, and, and the week following until the end of this month. You're really just honing in on what that looks like. I want to share a story with you all, because many of you don't know about my story and some things that I dealt with a couple of years ago. Hey, 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 Facebook. So just so you know who I am, I am the founder and visionary behind the Wives Who Win movement. I am Terrell Ravenel, your wife success coach. I help women to transform their lives and their marriages simultaneously. I do this by helping them to improve communication and maximize intimacy in their marriage, as well as experience internal change, dealing with that internal conflict. You know, many times there are issues and problems in the marriage. However, the issues and problems are normally more than just a marriage, more than just a husband and a wife that's a part of that marriage. So I, I get to the root of the problem, the root of the issue, the root of the conflict, and then teach you how to uh, um, constructively de-escalate any type of conflict. Because here's the thing, you know, 67% of problems in marriage are unsolvable, 67%, that's a big number. So what that means is that we have to learn how to manage those areas. We have to learn how to identify what's creating things to magnify or to metastasize, if you would, inside the marriage and manage those areas. So tonight, I'm not talking about that more or less, but this might be related. I'm talking more so about mental health and what we can do as wives, what we can do as women to make sure that we're healthy mentally and otherwise. We tend to focus on, you know, uh, other parts of our bodies. We, you know, if we get a cold, we go to the doctor or we take Tylenol or Robitussin or some type of medication over the counter or, or go get the flu shot or something like that when we're sick in our physical bodies we tend to take care of those things but when we're sick in our mind we tend to stray away from that and part of that is because of the negative negative stigmatism that mental health has in the black community you know when you say mental health or mental disorders or something is wrong with someone you tend to shy away from that and tend to label that person if you would is as, as crazy or um retarded they have been called retarded disabled and things of that nature which is not um nice of course at all it is not fair to say that because if you if, the, if you want to know the truth if you really want to know the truth let me know if you want to know the truth we all are predisposed to some level of mental illness, if you would. And the reason why I say that, because it can be PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And many people only associate that to individuals in the military. And that's not true. You know, other people can definitely develop some type of post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder from an incident or an accident, uh, anything acute, anything that's um, chronic or even complex. They can experience some level of PTSD, uh, as well as a number, number of others, as you can see my DM. DSM-5 back here that talks all about mental, the, the different mental disorders and mental illnesses and treatments and all of that stuff that people tend to deal with. So we, we all of us, if you've experienced a death of a parent, if you've experienced any form of abandonment, underlining abandonment is rejection, if you've experienced a severe car accident that could have left you dead, if you've experienced a heartbreak, um, if you've experienced a crisis, hello, what we're in right now, if you've experienced a loss of employment, uh, loss of relationships or any of that, those things are successable to you experience some level of, those are traumas, and it's also successful to you experiencing some type of mental illness, or it can lead to that if you do not get the help. So what does that mean with us as wives, as us that desire to be wise if you're not currently married? What does that mean for us? How do we how do we uh, take all of that in and still be able to be effective when we know we're dealing with all of these things? We're so busy at work. We're so busy taking care of the family. We're so busy trying to be a great wife. We're so busy in ministry. We're so busy starting this business or trying to maintain this business. We're so busy trying to be an entrepreneur. We're busy, y'all. I'm looking on social media and we're doing a lot of things. Women are thriving. We're opening up businesses at a greater uh, percentage than men. We're doing well in businesses. You know, we're becoming millionaires. We're doing all of these amazing things. But at what cost? At what cost are we doing these things? What are we sacrificing per se? What are we denying? Because here's the thing. If you give 100% to one thing, there are other areas in your life that will be lacking or missing. 
So when we give 100% to this one thing, then we can't give 100% or can't give 50% or 40% or whatever that number may be but to your husband, to your children, to you know your ministry or whatever the case may be. So we have to learn how to manage our expectations and how to manage our priorities. Hey, cuz. Hey, Shayla. How, how are you? Hey, Lauren Zeta. Zeta. Good to see you. So we have to learn how to do that. So I want to talk about my story just a little bit, and I'm going to share some things with you on anxiety and then also depression, and we'll get off here, okay? So a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago is when I first experienced um, anxiety. I had no idea what it was. I was driving in my car, and I would just experience these episodes. I, you know, I, I don't know if it was fear or, or what what was going on. I, you know, I was just driving. And I would experience episodes and just an overwhelming feeling came over me and I immediately got scared and worried and just felt uneasy, uncomfortable, all at the same time, all at the same time, right? So as I experienced that, I, I, you know, I went to the doctor, went to the hospital, tried to figure out what it was. They said nothing was wrong. I still didn't associate it to mental, um, any type of mental health issues or anxiety. That's the furthest thing that I thought about because I'm always busy. I'm always going, I'm always doing things. I'm, you know, my life can be high stress because of the many things and the many hats that I wear. So I never associated it to that because I've just been living life and doing things seamlessly with no problem for so long. Right. So it wasn't until we moved to the DC area and, and I was at work and I experienced one of these episodes, but this time it like, it didn't go away. And I stayed in that place of worry, scared, and filled with fear. And the overwhelming feeling was like I was about to die. I was having chest pains. I was having um, pressure in my head. I was feeling nauseated. I felt like I was having an aneurysm, a heart attack, and a stroke all at the same time. Like, no lie. If you've ever experienced an anxiety attack, if you've ever experienced it, it feels like you are dying, literally you are, it feels like you're experiencing all of these deathly things at one time. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I ended up going downstairs to the medic and getting checked out, went to the hospital, stayed there all night, came back home, there was nothing wrong. And then I had a few more of those episodes. And when I finally realized what it was, I began to read and research and I began to pray and ask God, what is going on? Why am I experiencing these things? What's going on in my life? What's going on in my marriage? What's going on? What's going on to whereas I'm at this point in my life, I've never experienced anything like this before. So why now? Why am I feeling like this now? Why am I worrying now? Because I'm not a person to worry. I mean, I worry, but I, I, mean, I don't have a chronic worry, worrying spirit. I don't, I don't chronically worry. I've been in some very tough positions in my life. I've been in some tough situations. I've, I've experienced a lot of things. I've experienced a lot of loss, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of disappointment. So I've done that. I've been broke. I've lost jobs. I've lost relationships. So I've, been, I've experienced a lot, I, I, a lot. So I'm like, why at this point in my life am I experiencing this? It, it didn't make sense to me, however, but it, but it did. Because at that time we were planning for our annual event. We had just moved. I just started a new position. There was a lot of great things that was going on. However, it was a lot. It was a lot. And sometimes we feel like because we're doing a lot of great things that we're good. I'm going to say no. Sometimes when we're doing, even though it's great, we have to learn how to, again, manage the priority and manage the, ex manage the expectation to make sure that we're not giving too much and we're not overwhelming ourselves and we're not taking the time out to care for our mental well-being. We're not taking the time out to rest. We're not taking the time out to get the sleep that we should be getting, to get the exercise that we should be getting and all of these things that we should be doing. We're not taking time out to do that because we're movers and shakers. We have to conquer the world. We have to leave a legacy and we have to make a million dollars and we have to be the best. And, and we have to do all of these things, the best mom, the best wife, the best leader, the best business owner, the best employee, the best employer. You know, We're always in the chase. We're always in the run. And some of us may feel like, oh my God, I should have did this five years ago I'm now I'm behind time so I got to spend more time doing this so I have to stay up late and I have to get up early in the morning and I have to do all of these things but then when are you taking care of yourself right when are we saying pause pause shy pause Shayla pause Felicia pause trail when are we saying pause let me stop let me reflect on everything that's going on 
and let me see if I have the mental and emotional capacity to do these things. Because sometimes even if you have the physical capacity, even if you can physically do it, that doesn't mean that mentally and emotionally you should. Somebody put that in the chat. Even though you have the physical capacity to, to do it, even if you have the financial capacity to do it, that doesn't mean that you should. It doesn't mean that you should. And we have to get out of the mindset that we're constantly in the chase and constantly comparing with the world where we should be, what we should be doing. Because our lives are on a totally different playing field. We're in a totally different lane. We've driven down a to totally separate street, highway. We're not in that same category. And we have to be okay with that. Then you have those that are experiencing life and things are happening to them or so they feel. They feel like things are happening to them and they're not able to manage the expectation of all of those things that are happening to them. What I do know is that my Bible tells me to cast all of my cares on God because he careth for me. So when we know that the world is at an uproar, that sometimes our households are at, a, at an uproar and we have no control over what's going on, we have no control over the external factors and the external environment, the only thing and the only person we can control is ourselves. there again, we need to pause and make sure how are we doing mentally? How are we doing emotionally? We have to check in with ourselves. Someone say check in. I need to check in with me. I need to check in with myself. I need to make sure I am okay because I can't be a great wife, shy, if I'm not a great person. I can't give my best as a mother if I'm not giving my best as Montrell, as Trell. I can't give somebody what I ain't got. And a lot of times we're trying to give other people what we don't have. We're trying to give out of our cup when we should be giving from our overflow. However, we don't have an opportunity to be filled and fueled because we're always going and doing and moving and trying to be the best. We're trying to be the best. We're trying to be the star. We're trying to, to, to develop this, this lifestyle, which is fine, but at what cost? There, at some point, there has to be a level of management and a level of priority that we must take control of. So here are some anxiety triggers that we need to be mindful of. And if any of these things resonate with you, say, hey, me, this is not to call you out. This is not to embarrass you or anything like that. This is to start the conversation, to continue the conversation and talking about our mental well-being because this is extremely important. So one trigger is health issues health issues. So if you know that you struggle with different health issues, um, it could be chronic or not chronic issues. It can be a, a recent diagnosis. It can be something else that you're, you're dealing with, diabetes or anything of that nature. You know, you want to make sure that you're taking care of those areas. This type of trigger is very powerful because of the immediate personal feelings it produces. This is personal. You're dealing with something, even if it's like cancer or multiple sclerosis or um, whatever other illnesses that are out there is, is serious, right? And, and pe some people are dealing with a lot of things. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, when you get this diagnosis or if this is something that you've been living with most of your life, that you are managing that, that you are taking the medications that you need to take, that you are doing the other things that your doctor has um, advised you to do. And I want to also say, get some level of therapy, coaching or mentoring, someone that can help your mental well-being also and help your behavioral pattern, help you with behavioral patterns and things of that nature. Um, you can reduce anxiety caused by health, health issues by being proactive and engaged, by being proactive and engaged. Number two, medications. Medications can be a trigger to anxiety depending on the type of medications that you're using. Certain prescriptions, prescription medicine and also over-the-counter medications may trigger some symptoms of anxiety. So let's say that you weren't taking this particular medication and you were fine and then you started taking a particular medication and you noticed that there were changes, you noticed that some things were different with you. And that's why when we start taking new things, we need to monitor. Take one thing at a time, even different things that they have going on with uh, supplements, um, you know, supplements to help with certain areas of your life. Be mindful of taking these things because your blood type and your, you know, what your chemical balance, you may not be able to ingest and 
um, your body may not respond the same way that somebody else's body response, body responds to something. These things are not a one fits all. Medications and other supplements, they're not a one person fits all. I know personally for me, I'm O negative. There are certain medications, there are certain things that my body does not respond well to. And see, we have to be aware of that. So when we're taking these things and trying out these things, you know, write down when you start taking it, write down the symptoms that you had. So when you get the new medication or supplement, write it down and track what you're feeling, what's going on with you for seven days. You know, one thing that I cannot take anymore is um, melatonin. And I know we produce it, but I had a bad effect when I took some melatonin and I attempted to go to sleep and I woke up and I could not walk. I was dizzy. I was on the floor. I was nauseated. I had a bad effect. So although that's something our body produces as a supplement, I cannot take. So make sure that you're mindful of what you're taking and what you're doing. Birth control pills. Birth control pills can be um, a trigger for anxiety. Uh, so be mindful of that. Different cough medicines and things of that nature, that can also be a trigger for anxiety, uh, weight loss medication. That's here too, weight loss medication. So just be mindful, you guys, when we're trying out these things that uh, we're monitoring how they're affecting us, okay? Caffeine, that was a, one for me. I stopped drinking caffeine altogether because it, it already has, it's caffeine, right? <laughs> so when you're drinking it, um, you know, you might say, well, I needed to wake up or I need to function throughout my day, but it also gives you this false boost, if you would, uh, because it doesn't last long. And eventually you start coming down or you have to keep drinking it to stay up. And that's not healthy. So make sure you're mindful of your caffeine intake. And if that's something that is producing anxiety, worry, fear, jitter, you know, your jittery, then you want to definitely um, step back and not take that. Okay. Skipping meals. When you don't eat, your blood sugar may drop and that can lead to jittery hands and rumbling tumble, tummy, tummies and it can cause anxiety it can, and make you feel like something is wrong. So we want to make sure we're eating a well-balanced meal, not if you're fasting and things of that nature, that's different. But if you're just not eating because you're too busy or you don't have time, then you really want to get a hold on that. Number five, a negative thinking. You know, negative thinking. We have to call our minds back into the kingdom of God. We have to cast down every thought, every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If it's not about the knowledge of God, if it's not positive, if it's not stimulating us positively, if it's not pouring into us, if it's not um, edifying us, we don't need to think about it. So your mind control your body. So whatever is in my mind is what's going to control my body. And that's true with anxiety. So we have to make sure that our thoughts are the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in you, which is all also in Christ Jesus, because we have so much that's going on in the world, and especially now during this COVID-19 operation, there's so much going on, so much worry, so much fear. Oh, I lose my job. Oh, I lost my job. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm not going to make enough money. I'm not going to do this. You know, this is never going to end. I'm going to get coronavirus. Somebody I know is going to get coronavirus. Somebody died I know that had coronavirus. So there's so many things that's going on, and we have to call our minds back, call our minds back into the kingdom of God. Say it right now. I call my mind back into the kingdom of God. I will not, not be subjected to negative thinking, to toxic thinking, to uh, disorderly thinking. I call my mind back. My mind belongs to God. I will refocus my mind. I will refocus my language. When I feel my mind is out of control, when I feel my thoughts are going out of control, I will refocus. I will re re refuel my mind with the kingdom of God, with the word of God, I will refuel my mind with positive thoughts in the name of Jesus. I will uh, establish healthy affirmations to speak over my mind every single day. So we have to call our mind back. I want to find, I did something on the mind of Christ. I want to find that. I want to find that because I want to share some of those scriptures with you. We have to call our minds back into the kingdom of God. I said, what did I do with it, y'all? Because I just felt led to do that. We have to call our thoughts back to God. And let me just share some scriptures with you. Some scriptures with you is on my phone, but my phone is on Instagram. 
be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4 and 23. So you say to yourself, I am renewed in the spirit of my mind. Galatians 3 and 2 says, set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. So that means that we should not be thinking about and worrying about what's going on in the world. It's going on, but there's nothing we can do with it, do about it. Some things may be going on in our personal lives and our relationships, and sometimes there's nothing we can do about it. And sometimes even when you can do something about it, you need to not do something about it because it's going to affect your mind. It's going to affect your mental capacity. It's going to affect your ability to think and to do what God has called you to do. My favorite scripture of all, and one that I stood on when my thoughts were all over the place and I couldn't get my thoughts to come back into subjection with the spirit of God. And when I felt worried all the time and negative and, and all of these things that were contrary to the word of God is Philippians 2 and 5. I used to say that verse over and over and over and over and again. Lord, let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. Another one of my favorites is Philippians 4 and 6. And it talks about do not be, um, I say, um, uh, whatever things are good, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report, let that mind be in you. I'm going to pull that one up because I want to say it right. Let that mind be in you. So that means that if it's not lovely, if it's not pure, if it's not godly, if it's not life-giving, if you don't have life-giving thoughts, you need to remove those, reject those out of your mind. Philippians 4 and 4. And then if you go down to Philippians 4 and, um, oh, hold on, 4 and 4. Hold on, y'all. I may have got the wrong verse. Uh, whatever things are lovely. What verse is that? Yeah, I know it's Philippians. Whatever it is. Philippians 4. Okay, so I'm going I'm to write a chapter. Philippians 4 and 4. And then, okay, then you go down to Philippians 4, 6, 4 and 6. So be anxious for nothing. Somebody say, I am not anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Therefore, Therefore, he said, listen, therefore, my beloved and long for brother and my joy and crown so steadfast in the Lord, uh, beloved. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let the gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Verse six, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. So he said, not only will I guard your heart, daughter, but I will also guard your mind. Somebody say, God guard my mind today. God guard my mind mind from these negative thoughts. Guard my mind from the things that are not true. Guard my mind from my old mind. Guard my mind from my old self. Guard my mind from thinking that I am not enough. Guard my mind for thinking that I can't do all things through Christ Jesus. Guard my mind, God, because I am created in your image and in your likeness. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And listen, we're reading scripture and we're praying and, and we're also need, we also need to make sure that if we need professional help that we're getting that too. I am a woman of prayer. If y'all know me, you know me. I am an intercessor. That's the anointing that's over my life. I will pray the house down. At the same time, I know when I need to go get professional help as well. So don't just say, okay, I'm gonna pray. That may work in addition to other things. If it's if it feels like it's not working and you need a strategy, you need tools and resources, do not hesitate to get those things. Amen. Okay. Verse eight, then it tells you meditate on these things. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on those things. Think on those things. Don't think on the things that are outside of the will of God. Don't think on the things that are negative. Don't think on the things that make you down and out and make you feel low or bad about yourself. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me do these things. But the only way we know that, um, woman, woman and woman and woman, <laughs> I would say woman and men, the only way we know to do those things that we've seen done in him is if we know the word of God. That's why it's important that we're reading our Bibles every single day. We're reading a script, a scripture. If we're not reading a chapter, we're reading a scripture every single day. We're getting into the word of God. We understand what the word of God says about us. We understand what God says about our life. We understand his love for us. We understand his commitment to us. We understand, right? We understand. So make sure I stay there a little bit because that's one, one of the 
uh, areas that um, is most prevalent is the thought process. Number six, financial concerns, worrying about saving money, worrying about um, debt, worrying about not having enough, worrying and worrying and worrying. Listen, when we leave this earth, there's nothing that you can take with you. Now, that doesn't mean that while you're here, you should not be a good steward over that which God has given you because the word of God tells us that we should be good stewards over everything that he's given us, which is our finances, um, our, our jobs, our employers, all of those things. We should be good stewards and we should make sure that we're managing them well, right? We don't want to be like the, the servant that took the talent and hit it. We want to do well with the, the things that he has given us. So if you have a fear of bills and debt, and all of those things, I want you to step step to the side. And at this point, I want to ask you to go back to go forward. What is it in your past that has you that has you with the mindset that you have concerning money? If it's spending too much money, if it's a fear of not of um, a fear of spending too much money, if it's a fear and you don't spend money at all and you just worry, 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 and you're just trying to get, 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 and you don't give because you have a scarcity mindset. Whatever it is, why? Have you developed that mindset? What was it like for you growing up? What is your money story? Um, you know, were, were the lights always getting cut off? Or did you not have enough food to eat? Or, or, or were, your, were, you know, were, did you get everything you want? That could be the opposite, right? Was money just given and you just spent whatever you had? I know my household, how I grew up, we spent money. And I later found out we really didn't have the money that we were spending. So guess who picked up those same habits, right? So you're spending money that you do not have and getting into all this debt and doing all of these things. And then you realize at some point where this, this is not the right way to go. This is not what we should be doing here. So we have to be mindful. And my sister tells a story where she had an anxiety attack over finances. So we have to know what is triggering us and we have to learn how to manage these type of triggers. And again, if you need to uh, seek any type of, of uh, um, professional help, please do that. Please do that. Um, social events, social events. If, it, if you're in a room full of people that sounds like, um, you know, it, it, you can't, accept that energy if it's a room full of strangers that doesn't sound like fun you know you're not alone you're not by yourself events that require you to make small talk like me i don't like making small talk i don't i'm not don't call me on the phone just to talk about your day type girl i'm not that girl not that i, I don't want to hear but i don't like oh how's the weather you know did you see the game last night like i don't i don't like that and for me that triggers anxiety so caffeine for me parties or social events that triggers anxiety for me negative thinking triggers anxiety for me so we have to know what these triggers are so if you know that you don't like to be in social gatherings or you don't like to be in crowds of people then take somebody with you if you need to go somewhere that's to work or to speak or whatever take somebody with you if you can um if you can't make sure you're 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 prayed up and make sure you know that you are prepared to go in that space and that you've already calculated mentally what can or what will go wrong or not go the way that you desire for it to go so when something happens like if the mic doesn't work if you're getting ready to speak or if the people didn't show up to the event or if, you know you show up to the event to be a vendor and there's nobody there you know instead of um allowing those moments to overwhelm and control you then you pre-calculate what can or will happen so that when it does that, you'll be prepared, okay? So to help ease your worry or unease, you can always bring a companion with you, as I stated before. So if your spouse wants to go, that's good too. And number eight, number eight is conflict. Conflict, so relationship problems, arguments, disagreements, that can also create anxiety, and that's a trigger for me as well. So if me and my husband are in a heated fellowship or we have a disagreement, I don't know why, but it does create a level of anxiety for me. So we have to understand if you don't want to be in that position or if somebody else and not my husband, um, but it can be anybody else. If we're in a strong disagreement or if I'm feeling really passionate about it and the person is disregarding me or um, or if they're not um, respecting what I'm saying or not hearing me out or not listening or, you know, if they come back strong with their, their emotions and their passion, that is a trigger for me. And I know that. So I don't try to get in those type of environments. I try to stay away from those type of environments and stay in a place of peace, calm and protecting my energy. So now we're talking about some triggers for anxiety. Let's talk about some triggers for depression because depression is another one and depression and anxiety 
anybody or cousins. When you have anxiety, and especially if it's prolonged or chronic anxiety, that can lead to depression because anxiety is feelings of worry, fear, uh, feeling scared and, and things of that nature. So if you're always feeling worried and scared and fearful, then you begin to feel like you're not enough, like um, you know, you can't take it, you can't take life. There's always something going on, you know, you hate your life, you hate what's happening to your life. So we have to be very mindful of what's happening around us so we can learn how to identify what's going on. Okay. So there's not a single cause per se uh, for depression. You know, people will talk about depression all the time, but science says that that's what I go by. There is not a single cause per se for depression. And, and it's not necessarily something you, it's not a gene. There's not a gene for depression. Like there may be a gene for other type of illnesses or diseases. That's not the case for depression. So, you know, there could be, it could be, it runs in the family, but it's not a gene per se. So it could be that your mom was depressed, your parent, your grandmother, your great grandmother, or your siblings. It could be that. And that could be something that um, has also impacted your life, but it's not necessarily a gene for depression. So just keep that in mind. So genes is one trigger. Another trigger is gender. Um, and, and why that's a trigger is because women are more prone to depression than men. It's not that men do not get depressed. It's not that men, and I'm gonna say that again, it's not that men do not get depressed. My son openly talks about his story of when, when he experienced depression. So it's not that men do not get depressed, y'all. We think because they're strong and because they're men that they don't. And that is a fall, a fell part and a misconception on our end. So, but women are more prone to depression than men are because women, we have so much complex lives. I talked about that earlier and our complex lives creates a level of stress and anxiety that a lot of times we are not managing. We're just doing it all ourselves and going about life and being mighty woman and being she Shira when we need to set our, set our tail down somewhere, okay? So that's one thing. Um, what else? Number two, number three, alcohol. Alcohol is a form or is a trigger, can be a, a trigger. And sometimes people drink alcohol to med to medicate the depression. So they're always feeling low or down, or they're feeling worried or experiencing some level of anxiety. They will utilize alcohol to numb the pain. You know, we are in a society where we are, you know, we spend the most money, we um, have the most, you know, we do, we do the most of this as a society and spending money, we're eating more than we should, we're unhealthy, you know, America is one of the most unhealthiest countries, so the United States of America is one of the most um, unhealthiest country. Why? Because we do things to numb the pain. We're drinking, we're smoking, we're living reckless, we're spending too much money, we're in too much debt, um, we're eating unhealthy. Why? Because we don't want to feel. We want to numb the pain. So whatever is pain to us, we are utilizing these things to numb the pain. How many of you have gone shopping and knowing you had no money to be shopping? Come on, somebody. Uh oh, okay, I'm back. You know, going shopping, knowing you don't have the money to shop. No, you know, doing things, knowing that you should not be doing them. Why? Because you're trying to numb or feel better, right? Feel better. So we want to make sure that we're not utilizing those things. And alcohol is one of those things. And also heavy use, 20%. Heavy use is also known to bring depression. So if you heavily drink alcohol, that also will bring about a form of depression. Life events, that's what we're in right now. We're in a major life event. It's not necessarily, it, it can be directed to you if you are an essential worker and having to work um, or if you lost your job, all right? This can be a trigger. It can be a trigger. Life events. So major life events has the potential to result in depression. So if you're feeling low and down, the big question is ask yourself why. What's going on in my life right now that I'm experiencing this? Why am I experiencing this? Why am I feeling like this? Why is this bothering me? 
okay, yes, I lost my job. Can I tell y'all something? And I'm not comparing myself to anybody. I've been in a position where I lost four, I got laid off four times consecutively. It was back to back. One job, I got laid off. I got another job, I got laid off. I moved across the country to San Diego, got a job, got laid off, got another job and got laid off. So I get it. I understand. And I had a, a young son at the time that I had to take care of. So I get it when you have children, <clears throat> when you're responsible for taking care of others, when you're uh, responsible for just taking care of yourself, even if you don't have children. I, I understand how life events can happen, even divorces, relationship breakdown, a death of a parent, death of a sibling, death of a child. I've experienced you know, a death of a sibling, a death of a child, and a death of a parent. My brother died at birth. I never got to meet him, but I guess I didn't really experience it, but you get what I'm saying. Just even that longing of never having that brother, Kenneth was his name, a brother I wanted, I never had. Even that longing, that could be a life event. I can relive something and my mind and thoughts can ruminate on the fact of what happened, why did it happen, why my parents didn't try again for another brother or, you know, just all these things. If you allow your mind to go there, it will go there. I lost my father right? Three days before my 17th birthday. That's a life event. And that's a traumatic experience. I lost a child in 2015. I had a miscarriage. So we have to know what are these things, what is happening in my life or what has happened in my life that is creating a level of stress or is creating some type of feeling that I can't explain or that I don't like or feels uncomfortable to me. Okay. Another trigger is isolation and loneliness. I have to be very careful with this because I like to be alone. I, it's nothing for me. This, this COVID-19, this is right up my alley because I don't mind being home the, all day, every day. I can be home, be alone, be fine and things of that nature. Thankfully, my husband is here because he typically, we both travel a lot, but him more than me. So he's been here with me, you know, this entire time. So I, I didn't, go in my shell because he's here. I had to show up, right? But just be mindful of wanting to be alone all the time and feeling socially isolated. So make sure that you're not, you know, making yourself um, be, dis you're not making yourself or making excuses for why you're disconnecting from other people. We don't want to be disconnected. Feeling socially isolated is confidence sapping and your inner voice begins to question your worth as a person and your value to society. So you don't want to start thinking, nobody don't like me. Nobody don't want to be around me. I'm not worthy. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. So don't, don't be so isolated and so in a place of loneliness because we're never alone because God is with us. But if you're experiencing that, call up a friend, get on um, Zoom and do a Zoom call with somebody, do FaceTime, make sure you're staying in touch. I have a, a, a girlfriend that she's bad with this and I'm gonna get on her. She likes to go in isolation for a long period of time. And then she comes out of isolation I, and I get the call of her life and things of that nature. However, that's very dangerous to be in that place because your thoughts are all over the place. Illness is another trigger, the same as anxiety. Illness, even short-term illnesses such as flus and all, all of those things, the flu, corona, things of that nature, these things can change your mood. Um, but some longer term chronic conditions also can be life changing. So depression is a common place following your following different um, uh, surgeries or uh, different uh, routine uh, things that you may have done. Like uh, it's saying right here, heart attacks, heart surgery or heart attacks is a common place for depression, for example, but a range of other conditions from hormonal imbalances to cancer, chronic pain, all increase the risk of depression. I'm going to also say like perimenopausal, menopause, because things are going on with your body. And a lot of times you're not understanding when your body starts acting funny and doing different things, even in a marriage, if your libido is low or has gotten low, you know, those things are hormonal. Those things can bring on anxiety. Why? Because if your libido is low, right, that means that you're not, you don't desire sex as much. So then um, you're not having sex as much because you don't desire it then you're probably worrying about, okay, if I'm not having sex with my husband, then who is, or my wife, then who is, or I can't please them. So just so many things, it's like a ripple effect or can be. So, but when you understand, you're able to not only manage those things, but you can talk to your spouse 
and share with him or her, you know, what's going on with you so that you all can work through those things together. Okay. And then the last trigger for um, depression is personality. So whether that's due to your your, your bloodline or life experiences or both, you know, some people just have a low, uh, gloomy type view on life and become very critical and negative and unhappy. They're very pessimistic people who worry and feel personally inadequate. So people like this, you know, they can suffer from major depression and that's scary. That can be very scary. So we have to just be mindful of what's going on with us. Why is it going on so that we can show up better and we can show up, um, you know, healthier mental, mentally. And when we see things happening, y'all, we can't wait until it gets so bad. We can't wait to the point where we're wanting to commit suicide or we're having suicide thoughts or we're feeling so low. If you stay in that place, consistently, you know, it's been days and now weeks and now months, and you've been thinking how bad you are as a person and you've been filled with shame and shame is taking over your life, taking over your mind. And shame is saying there's something wrong with me. Whereas guilt is saying I've done something wrong. So if you're constantly internally feeling like there's something wrong with you, or if you're constantly feeling like you did something wrong in life, period, you need to, I'm telling you, I am encouraging you, I am pleading, please talk to somebody. Call, that is not a normal behavior when it's consistently constant. You know, every now and again, yes, you, oh my God, I messed up. I did something wrong. Or, Man, I suck. Okay, that's fine. But when you're constantly in that place and it becomes chronic, it becomes consistent, it becomes a part of who you are, that is not normal. So get the help that you need. Call a friend, phone a friend, phone a therapist, phone a coach, a, a mentor, somebody that you can talk to, a spiritual advisor, a leader, somebody that you can talk to and that can help bring you up, pull you up, pull you out of that dark place, pull you up from that dark place and speak life into you and also give you some strategies and some tools that you will need to incorporate daily. Because the, the, the first thing is you got to identify what's going on what's going on around me, what's happening, why it's happening, and then begin to implement some type of strategy to be able to manage those areas. So that's our conversation for tonight. I pray that this has been helpful for you. I pray that something I've said uh, resonated with you and you can take this information, you can apply it to your life and you can be better as a result because our relationships, our marriages, um, our, the world around us can only be better um, if we are better. So we are committed to being better. So next Friday, we'll be here once again, talking about how to manage marriage and mental health. Instagram, thank you so much for joining me on this evening. Facebook, thank you all for joining me on this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you to all my replay viewers that will watch the replay. Uh, I, I truly do appreciate it and from the bottom of my heart. And I pray that you all have an amazing weekend. I'll be back 5.30 a.m. Thank you, April. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, ladies, and all those that I cannot see. Thank you, Shai. I appreciate you all so very much. Monday, every Monday morning at 5.30 a.m., we are praying, praying for our marriages, praying for our uh, us as wives, praying for others' marriages, praying just for us as women every Monday in the Wives Who Win Learning Center. And we've started praying Monday through Friday in another community that we have and just sharing that on various platforms. Because if there has not been a time for prayer, the time is now. The time is now. Turning down our plates, praying, interceding for others, and as the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. So you guys have a good night, have an amazing Friday and have an enjoyable weekend. And I will talk to you soon. All right, bye.